Hello, thanks for coming. We are so delighted to have you all here and to have our special guest, Dr. Gutman, and to have Dean Becke, my boss. It's always fun to interview the <laughs> boss. Um, and I was asking Amy on the way here how many degrees she had. Do you, do you have an aunt? Um, enough. Okay, because we have not, because neither <laughs> Dean nor I don't have, neither of us has a degree. We're both are college dropouts, so we would like to borrow a couple of viewers. You're, you're <laughs> welcome. You're welcome, Mr. <laughs> Sun. So, um, you know, that the topic is the education in the post-truth era, and it's mind-boggling to me as a media columnist here how much, how many conferences I'm going to like this, and we still haven't figured it out. Yeah. It's just insane. And I'm wondering from both of your perspectives, is this like a post-truth crisis? Like, is this a crisis, or is this noise? How much is panic, and how much is this a real severe problem? You go first. So it's not a moment. If it is a moment, it's longer than most of our students' lifetimes. Uh, it is not, um, it didn't just come up uh, last, in the last election. It's been a long growing trend and it's an extremely serious problem. I would not call it post-truth. Um, uh, as an era any more than I would call our era post-racial or the end of history, but make no mistake about it, it, the trend threatens not only our institutions, journalism and education, but it, it threatens the very fabric of democracy. And it's not exaggeration to say, if let unresponded <coughs> to, it would threaten the very basis of civilization. Right, so it's growing and just getting worse. Then. I, I actually think um, I, I don't. I, I actually think it's always been there. Um, I mean, I, I I thought as a journalist, the first my first exposure to this moment was during the the Vince Foster. I don't know if yeah. those of you remember oh, yeah. the suicide of Vince Foster, which um, for, for which there were just many made up stories about. But because, because social media had not developed to the point where it is now, it largely remained a story in Washington and New York and among the media. If you can imagine the Vince Foster story today, it would, to be blunt, it would be on Fox and Friends. They would not have checked it out. Um, they would just use it. It would just be, so I'm, I, I think it's been with us, um, but I think the rise of social media, which of course is one of the greatest things to happen to society, um, has also provided a forum to exaggerate and for lies too. And I, and, but I, but I agree, agree that it's a, it's, it's you know a dramatically threatening moment for the media and for academia. Right, because I know that when I first covered mm -hmm. politics at this newspaper, or my first presidential campaign was '04, and Penn, you guys, factcheck.org was launching at Penn, which was a fact-checking website. And I don't know if it was before PolitiFact, but it was yeah. right there with it. So it was clearly an issue in 04, but you could sort of, as <coughs> journalistically, right, we could address a false narrative. And maybe just addressing it was a mistake because you were going to raise it up and people were going to notice it, and now it's everywhere. No, it's, 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 point. it's not a mistake to address it. And, and the social media has run with false facts, but it's also a means of combating them quickly. So let me give you a pre-social mm -hmm. media viral um, falsity that has claimed more lives than I, you know, we have counted, which is a, a fraudulent article in Lancet connecting autism to vaccines. And that was published in 1998, and it took until 2010 for it to be retracted. In that period, mm -hmm. So much damage has been done that, you know, this spring in Minnesota, there have been dozens of children coming down with measles, a disease that otherwise would have been eradicated in the United States. <clears throat> but social media, if you use it quickly the way PolitiFact and factcheck.org now and fact checkers now, you know, at the New York Times and other major media, that is absolutely essential. The speed of combating a bad virus, so to speak, is essential now, and the social media is a means to do that, but it hasn't yet been used to its fullest in the positive sense, while it has been, it's just with the, you know, as you say, the difference between yeah. Vince Foster and the things that are happening now. Yeah. 
are social media driven. Yeah. Right, because you felt compelled as our editor to hire a new full-time. No, that's right. right. I thought not only did I feel compelled to, I mean, it's funny, in the era I grew up in journalism, if a bad story got out, you ignored it. Um, in fact, you thought, and you, you, you alluded to this, you thought that if you wrote about it, we did not write about the allegations that Vince Foster yeah. was murdered. Um, we just thought if the New York Times wrote about that and put it on its front page, some people would believe it and it would give credibility to an obvious lie. Um, I, think, I think if that happened now, we would feel compelled to knock it down right away. We would feel compelled to take it apart right away. Um, but I also think, by the way, that um, I, I keep mentioning Fox because I think Fo Fox has done some things that, are, that, are, that are, are bad for the media and the credibility of the media and elevating those kinds of stories is one of them. Right, because Sean Hannity <coughs> now do a segment. Oh, he would have. He would have. Uh, Sean Hannity would have done a twelve-part series on Vince Foster at this point. Right, and and previously the political operatives had to buy dirty money ads to right. get these out there. Now it's on primetime TV. Right. But I can't imagine um, since I did attend college, uh, I can <laughs> I can't imagine what this is doing <coughs> on campuses because. What's all, what we're sort of dancing around here is this relativism, that there is no truth, right? Your, whose truth is, is most important and are facts real, which does feel a little bit new to me that, that that's the sort of extreme we're at. So do you have, is it an issue on campus where students are really ready to believe anything as fantastical as it is because they already have open minds? Uh, no, I, I actually think relativism has been with us a long, long time. It's the same. Uh, you know, it's the same phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It just spreads more quickly with social media. Our students are pretty darn engaged in uh, wanting to combat, you know, falsehoods. And uh, it's the difference between what you believe theoretically and what you believe when you're confronted with blatant falsehoods. Um, so climate change, for example, vaccines and autism, and it spans the political spectrum, although we have to confront the fact that there is an asymmetry in the distrust of news media between the left and the right, even though what is symmetrical is the great segmentation of our publics. But our, our students are eager to figure out ways of being engaged in um, combating falsehoods and e not to be confused with the belief that facts and evidence are subject to interpretation and debate, and that's what we have to keep open. It would be all <coughs> too easy if it were just, there are the facts and there are the truths, and we just have to be great um, champions of the truth. Um, we do have to be champions of truths, but our students also want to debate uh, issues that are open to interpretation and haven't been exposed. Right, but uh, in, in turn, on the other side though, and I think there, be, there will be a lot of discussion about this over the next couple of days here, what do you say to those that college yeah. campuses seem closed-minded from the left, that they don't want to hear the kind of more controversial voices or the, do you, you know, do you have a racist on your campus and should he or she be heard and how, how's Penn been dealing with that? Which is the same so, criticism that's leveled at the news media, right. by the way. So <clears throat> the, we have uh, an open expression policy and we have a long standing statement about open expression born of controversy a long time ago uh, where open expression was asserted against real threats on campus. So we have open expression policy, we have open expression observers who are trained in the case of people coming to campus who have unpopular views, and there's a real um, pride on campus in that culture at the same time as there is not any, um, any desire to um, admit students according to their political views in order to get mm -hmm. an, a, you know, a balance. <clears throat> there, 
there is a real desire to do outreach and to under um, serve communities, and, and that's something that's really important because we, we live in silos. So open expression is alive and well at Penn. It is definitely a challenge at university campuses, um, and it's a challenge we have to really stand fervently up to, just fervently up to. And by the way, it is not, it is not in contrast to being um, inclusive and welcoming to minorities of, of whether they're ideological minorities or racial minorities or ethnic or socioeconomic minorities. We have to do both, and that's that's a challenge. Right. Some, sometimes I think the um, the crisis is not a crisis of truth. Sometimes I think it's a crisis of sort of honest inquiry. I think that the the I, I get tons of critical emails from the left and the right um, daily. And sometimes I think that the inability of either side to understand each other or speak to each other is because there is just a complete closed-mindedness. I'm not, I'm not talking about you know, racism or out and out evil. I'm talking about debating the larger issues of the day. I'm talking about you know, whether it's what trade policy should look like or or even you know the you know <laughs> broader more existential philosophical issues. I think that there's people don't want to hear it. They don't want to have. I don't want to be too blanket, but but there's not. A, they're not. A, one, what we we hired at the at the um, New York Times, and I run the news report and not the opinion <laughs> report. Not responsible for <clears throat> Stevens. But I but I but I I have defended it. Um, the editorial page hired um, Brett Stevens who's a brilliant editorial columnist for the Wall Street Journal, um, who's, very, who's mm -hmm. to the right of our editorial page on many things, but climate change is the most. And I don't, I don't I've, I've read his work, and again, I didn't hire him, but I don't think Brett is a climate change denier. Um, I think what Brett is is someone who wants to challenge the notion that any challenges to what people should do in the name of climate change um, are verboten, that you just shouldn't have the discussions. And the outcry against the hiring of Brett Stevens, whereas my view is who but a news organization should surface thoughtful, honest discourse? W w James Bennett, the editorial page editor, did not hire the leader of the Klan. He hired a guy who is much more conservative on the issue of climate change than our editorial pages. He, he hired somebody who, who makes, we don't have to agree with it, but who makes a cogent case that a lot of our readers, I think, should hear. And I think, to me, that's, that's honest inquiry as opposed to the debate over truth. But do you think that 10 years ago, similar situation, the reaction would have been say, the same. Like William Sapphire yeah. was a very thoughtful columnist, but <clears throat> on, in campaign years, he came home to the Republican fold, and I don't remember. Think of Sapphire was even more. Sapphire was not only a conservative columnist on a lefty editorial page; he had been Richard Nixon's right. speechwriter, um, and even came up with a phrase for Spiro Agnew nattering nabobs <laughs> of negativism. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> so. No, I think there's much more. I, I don't know if there's more of an outcry now, but people have a forum to express their anger now. So a million people might have been really upset and went nuts when the New York Times hired William Sapphire. They didn't have a way to express it. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any other place to go. You lived in New York, you read the New York Times, or you read one of the tabs. Um, and if you read the Washington Post and you lived in New York, you got it a day late, probably, in terms of the mail. So people didn't have a choice. Now they have a choice, and they have a place to just go nuts about it, and they do. Well, the other phenomenon is that people much more live in ideological media bubbles, um, which are non-intersecting now. Um, and uh, they, the, uh, the amount of distrust in, uh, according to <coughs> Gallup surveys, in every major institution that they survey, 14 major institutions, whether it's religious or media or Congress or banks, or they don't have a survey, a, 
alas, of universities, but I have no doubt that trust in us has gone down as well. It's gone down dramatically, and in just the past decade, it's gone down dramatically. And the most troubling of all is the distrust among the American public has rapidly declined. From when I graduated college, um, about half people said they distrusted people on the other side. It's it's now um, like 80% of Americans feel in the past, you know, <coughs> last year, 80% of Americans said they did not have a common factual agreement with the other side. And how does that evidence itself on your campus? Because again, that's talk about the ultimate bubble, right? And you probably get to see this in a Petri disc dish sort of fashion, right? Yeah, well, it, the most evidence for it is how important and how it is for us to actually engage in dialogue across divides. And so um, we had what we, we have what we call a campaign for community on our campus, which we invite faculty and students and staff to have uncomfortable conversations. Uh, it's actually a term that one of our deans, John Jackson, Junior came up with the uncomfortable conversations that are needed. Now, I could imagine um, that you know decades ago you would never have that, but not because a lot of uncomfortable <coughs> conversations were being had. Right. Um, they weren't. It was just because the way people had a more common factual basis and we weren't as hyperpolarized as we are now. This is an American and a global phenomenon. And I would add one other thing about it, the trend, um, which it's really important that for all of the openness that we are fervently um, committed to, both the New York Times and Penn and higher education and, and responsible journalism, the, the, trend, the most common phenomenon among journalists uh, that was not good was the balanced story, that every story had to have two sides. Yeah. And it was parodied in 2004 <laughs> by senior correspondent in the field, Rob Corddry, mm -hmm. in the Swift Boat controversy, who right. said, you know, it is not my job to stand between um, my listening to the people and my telling the people what they've said. And you know, John Stewart said, "Yes, it is your job. That's precisely your job." That was the precursor to mm -hmm. fake news. And one of the, I think, one of the, the positive phenomena that's come out of really um, attacking fake news, and it should be attacked, is I don't think we'll go back to that balance, those fake balance stories anymore. Right, but we've been criticized in that same vein now from the right, and I wrote a column that is constantly brought up, which I stand by, of course, um, that said we got rid of balance, right? So Dean, which I don't think we did, but, but Dean, from your standpoint, you do have to worry a little bit, right, about not having false balance, but not getting too far the other way where you're gonna alienate right. Trump supporter who you're trying to reach with our, yeah. our journalism. No, actually, I actually think in, it's funny in in editing the paper. I don't think a whole lot about in, in thinking about particular stories, alienating people, because I think that's a sort of dangerous mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. position to put yourself in. Um, I'm not saying that I wantonly go. Let's see who <laughs> I can piss yes. off today. I don't mean that, but I think I think that. Um, I think, I think there's a difference between balanced inquiry and false balance. Balanced inquiry is making sure you get the entirety of the story. Mm -hmm. Going into a story with an open mind to the possibility you were wrong. And, and if the people who disagree with the premise of the story um, are thoughtful about it, including their voices. Um, I, I think that's, to me, that's the essence of journalism. Right. False balance is throwing in the, um, you know, the three paragraphs that say, but some say, and you know in your heart it's sort of bullshit. Right. And I think that's, I think that, right. I do think that journalists 
historically have been in the habit of doing that. I think that started to, I think that started to erode, by the way, d during Vietnam, um, but it sort of held on tight. I do think it's probably gone for good, I hope so. Right, it's like in that famous Access Hollywood tape, there was no like, but on the other hand. On the other hand, <laughs> what he said might, yeah. could be construed yeah. as not a bad thing. That was an easy call, right? right. But it's not, these aren't all easy calls. But one thing about, so in terms of, can I, I give, can I say one, I'm, I'm sorry. You're the boss, you can say whatever <laughs> <three laughs> you want. <laughs> I mean, here, here, just to you. I'll have to remember <laughs> that. You're the boss, too. It doesn't well, happen in universities like that, does it? <laughs> it doesn't never, happen, never, it doesn't never, happen in here either. either. It doesn't, it doesn't happen, happen here either. What are you doing to me? I can't think of a faculty yeah, member who's ever said that, for that. <laughs> I've lost some pride on that one. I do, I do think that we did, that the, an instance in which I think the opposite is dangerous, I do think sometimes when, when, the, when the, cut, the press covered complex issues like trade and NAFTA, I do think that that wasn't, it, I wouldn't call yeah. it false balance. I, I think we were so, and this is, this is where the criticism of us as elite comes from, and, it, and, it's, and it's probably true. I do think we, we didn't necessarily grapple with the impact that some of those issues, that, that complicated issues like trade would have yeah. on the broader society. And I don't think it would have been a false balance to have gone out and said, okay, even though every economist I have talked to says that this trade policy is a good thing for the overall economy, <clears throat> I do want to make sure I get the voices of people who will be hurt by it because people will be hurt by it. That to me is, I wouldn't call it balance. I would call that sort of honest inquiry. I want to make sure, and, and, and one of the reasons people were so angry at the press um, in the last election is I think people thought we didn't explain that or consider it as a possibility. We just said, look, get it. Trade with China is good. Don't you get it? I have 10 Nobel Prize winners, I'm quoting in my story tomorrow, right. who say more trade with China is good. Are you some kind of an idiot? I'm, I'm caricaturing our attitude, but not too much. I think we should have under, we should have at least understood that there are people who didn't see it that way and whose lives would have been affected by it. Yeah, I think there's something really profound about following that line of inquiry, which is it is not enough for us, and I'll talk about universities and journalism here, it's not enough for us just to um, uh, address the problem of fake news and false balance and so on. It's really important to diagnose the problem. This problem of hyperpolarization, this problem of people wanting to believe falsehoods has <coughs> deep roots right. and it has deep roots in economic segmentation of uh, growing inequalities, uh, growing residential segregation, growing educational segregation, a big divide between the haves and the have-nots in lots of sectors. And people, we in universities need to, and we do, but we need to double down and support the kind of research into why people want to believe falsehoods. What, what are the antidotes to confirmation bias? We all have, and it, Phil Tetlock at Penn has really shown through research that it's not enough to tell people you believe something that's false and here are the reasons, the 20 reasons why. You real, people have to want to de-bias themselves and in order to want that, you have to believe something good is at stake for you. Um, that by, you know, agree, that <coughs> by agreeing that there's man-made climate change or agreeing that NAFTA, these are the facts about NAFTA, that you're not gonna just be left Government is going to take over your lives in negative ways. Um, so I think there's a lot of diagnostic work to be done and in-depth reporting. <coughs> Investigative reporting is more important than ever. And for universities, our supporting the you know, neuroscience research, the psychological research, the political science research that really gets to causes and then antidotes and speaking publicly about them. I think there's never been a more important time for journalism and education in that area. And if your neuroscience people want some test cases, we got a whole building filled. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. This might be a good, uh, well, we're running out of time, so I, and I want to get to some questions. 
So I think this would be, even though I could keep going here, it's a good time to break. And Adam is the man with the questions. Sure, we're getting a lot of questions from the audience and Facebook Live. Um, the first one is for Dean, is there such a thing as unbiased journalism? Uh -huh. When in fact we are all humans with opinions, experiences, et cetera, including your reporters. You know, I don't, I hate the even notion of unbiased journalism. There is, there is a, if, if you literally take the words, of course there's no such thing as unbiased journalism. Um, I think that, that there's fair journalism, and I keep using the phrase, I use it again, honest inquiry. Of course a reporter who, you know, I grew up in the South, um, and I have views about the South that are different than the views I had when I lived in California. Here's what I think. I think, I think good journalists are open-minded and listen. I think they put the worst of their biases in their pockets. And I think their editors help them get rid of the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's great. We also have some questions just really related sort of the crystal ball. Are five, ten years from now, are we still going to be having this discussion? Is the, the bubbles that we live in with our Facebook news feeds, are they going to get worse? What is this conversation going to sound like five, ten years from now? Let's you start with Amy. <laughs> so That's the easy one. You go ahead. All right, right. So... Um, we will still have conversations about ideological bubbles and uh, fake news. There was yellow journalism as long as there's been journalism there. Have all major institutions, whether it's business or universities, um, skew one way or the other on political spectrums, and we have to do our best to correct for that. What I think will be radically different, judging from history, is what are the big dangerous falsehoods we're arguing about? Just think about the scare over HIV and all the misinformation about it and all of the prejudice against you know, LGBTQ. The language wasn't even there um, in everybody's lifetime. Uh, that has been countered, so what we will see is that in many places the truth will out and many discriminations will fade. But as I said, we're not in the post-racial, we'll not, we're not gonna ever be in the post-racial era or the end of history or there will never, and there will never be a time when some people aren't taken in by falsehoods. Right. So we'll still be having conversations like this. We'll just make, progress on what truths are accepted. And there are truths that are accepted. We should still be debating them to make sure we keep them alive. Right, right. Dean? You know, I was, I, I was sometimes when I, uh, yes, we will be having this debate. We probably could have had the debate, you know, 50 years ago. I, I actually think that the, that the world of social media has not introduced new stuff into the society. I think it's given, um, a place for stuff to rise. I think, I think everything we're, we're talking about um, has existed in some form or another forever. Mm -hmm. I think the fact that we're being forced to have the debate, even though I think, you know, obviously I think <coughs> false news is a terrible thing, the fact that we're being forced to have the debate is good and healthy for the society. Mm -hmm. The fact that we can have the debate right. speaks volumes about our society, and we should never take that for granted. Uh, just have to look around the world to see the opposite of, of having that debate. So may the debate rage and we'll make progress, but we'll still have plenty to debate five, ten, hundred years from now. Works for us. It's good for our business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, good for ours, too, but <laughs> it's mainly good for democracy and society. Right. Lots of questions from the audience. I uh, hope I'm pronouncing this correctly from Linda Ubre in the audience. How should we as higher ed leaders manage the tension between free expression and potential hate speech? This question is for you, Amy. Um, we should uh, defend free expression and not shut down offensive, hateful speech. We should also use our voices to counter hateful, offensive speech. Free expression alone is not <coughs> enough. 
Um, free expression is necessary, but it isn't sufficient. It, I will, it is necessary, so I'm not qualifying its necessity, but I am qualifying that it is not the panacea to really come to what its value is. And its value is to encourage, allow everybody to speak up and denounce, including demon peaceful demonstrations against terrible speech. And that's something I think we can be very proud of. I um, am encouraged by the peaceful activism of our students. I am not encouraged when I see speakers being shouted down or forced to withdraw from campuses. And we will, at Penn, and I think at many universities, stand up against that kind of shutting down and also stand up and speak out, including speaking out against powerful political people who put out policies that would be against our, our core mission, like the executive order to ban immigrants from seven countries. We took a very strong stand against that. Okay. And this next question, uh, anonymous from the audience, could take us through breakfast tomorrow, oh. but I'm going to finish with <laughs> uh, 60 seconds from each of you. Could you reflect on what you think are the causes of the hyperpolarization that threatens our pursuit of yeah. balanced inquiry? What's causing the polarization? Well, I, I, I don't think it, I think the country's been polarized for a very, very long time. I think that we're seeing, I think social media has given an expression for the polarization. Yes, I think that people tend to live with other people like them, but I think, I, I actually think this, this anger and the polarization has been around for a long time. I think that people have many, many, many more ways to express it. So, I agree that people have more ways to express it. It also, there's overwhelming evidence that our politics is more hyperpolarized than it's been in the, it's, it's increasingly hyper, more and more hyperpolarized. And I think some of the causes of that are the um, segmentation of our publics. Uh, economically, residentially, and ideology, you know, and social media contributes to that. So here's the big difference in the media landscape, which we alluded to earlier, but let me just put a, you know, not to put a fine point on it. Um, in the days of, which is historically of hype, of yellow journalism, um, there were segmented publics, but Today, since people are immersed, their lives are immersed in social media. <clears throat> um, Facebook's algorithms tell a billion people around the world what they want to read, listen to, and so on. And that feeds hyperpolarization. So it's overdetermined uh, today. Great. Back to All you. right, we have the red light, so that was perfectly timed. No, you timed. have to answer that question. Oh, oh yes. I have to answer that question? <laughs> I mean, we did have a civil war, right? So, you know, imagine if we had Facebook then. <laughs> <You know. laughs> but so, to your point, it's not new. I do think that, that, that social media has put it and has made it so much worse, and it makes all of our yeah. jobs that much more important. Yeah. Well, another thing that the civil war points out is there are worse things in the world than hyperpolarization, yeah. right? Way so. worse. So on that note, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thanks so much. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, Jim, thank you. Thank you, Dean.